Welcome back everyone, this is going to be my video about who is going to take the mantle of the next Black Panther during Wakanda Forever. We just got the first trailer and it reeled a bunch of clues telling us who it is and how Marvel pulls it off. A lot of you also asking if they're ever going to bring Killmonger back because there's so many big twists with characters coming back in the MCU using different methods. Yes, he is in the movie, but not the way that you expect. So a version of Killmonger is coming back to the MCU. If you're brand new to the channel, She-Hulk episode one is starting next week. I'll be doing videos for all the episodes. Be sure to subscribe to get them. And we're gonna be doing a Marvel Disney Plus giveaway during that. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and let me know in the comments who you think the new Black Panther is going to be. But just starting at the beginning, in the Black Panther Wakanda Forever trailer, they show us a couple montages of the events of the movie. The trailer scenes are mostly in chronological order, with a few exceptions. Like, there are a couple flashbacks to, like, Namor's birth, for instance, way earlier in the MCU timeline. And they mix and match a couple different scenes. Like, some of the scenes are from the same scene, just broken up across a couple different points in the trailer. But mostly they're showing you things in chronological order, how things escalate to all-out war between Wakanda, Atlantis, and Namor and the appearance of this brand new Black Panther. Most Marvel movies take place like one right after the other in the Marvel timeline. Some take place around the same time, but mostly it's like one right after the other. So like Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness takes place after Spider-Man No Way Home. Thor Love and Thunder takes place after Doctor Strange 2. So the present day of Black Panther Wakanda Forever starts after the events of Thor Love and Thunder. Maybe not that long after, but a little bit after at least. And according to Taika Waititi in Marvel, Thor Love and Thunder is meant to take place about three years after Avengers Endgame. So Wakanda Forever is mostly around three to four years after Avengers Endgame, which is about how much time has passed in real life, just in terms of years after Avengers Endgame was released in theaters. They begin the trailer with a funeral procession for T'Challa. The reason they're all wearing white is because in some cultures around the world, in this area of Africa that Wakanda comes from, people wear white to funerals instead of black. That's more like a European and American thing. The reason why they're performing this large dance like they're celebrating but everyone has this mixture of happy and sad faces is because per their customs the funeral is meant to celebrate his life so they're celebrating his memory but that's why Shuri is so sad because she lost her brother. I believe the way they're explaining him passing away isn't like some crazy assassination from Namor in the comics or anything like that. I think he's meant to die from a long illness. After this, you eventually see a team of researchers in the deep sea diving gear. They're heading into the ocean looking for vibranium deposits underwater. That's why you see them invading this facility in Wakanda later in the trailer. While they're doing this earlier in the movie, though, they wind up discovering Atlantis by accident, which is why Namor gets pissed off, because it was supposed to be hidden like Wakanda was hidden from the rest of the world this whole time. This is where we get to the Ironheart Riri Williams plot, why she's such a big part of the movie. Riri Williams is supposed to have designed the deep sea diving gear that allows them to survive those lower depths. Because the diving suits here are built kind of like derivatives of Iron Man armor suits, like the same type of technology that she uses to build her Ironheart suits. She builds her own super advanced armor suits. It makes sense that's how she earns money for herself on the side, by contracting with them. Like, we will pay you a giant dump truck of money if you design us some armor suits that will allow us to look at the bottom of the ocean. This is where we get to the Doctor Doom, Doom War plot stuff. And I believe he's only going to be referenced very lightly in the movie. Like, he's not a big character in the movie or anything like that. Like, maybe at the end, like a post credit scene or something like that, will tease that Doctor Doom was kind of pulling the strings from behind. But he's supposed to be the person in the MCU who's funding this research looking for more vibranium. So he's the person who's effectively paying Riri Williams, using a bunch of different sources to hide his identity. In the comic book version of Doom War, he just outright invades Wakanda trying to steal their vibranium, kind of like Ulysses Claw. He basically wants to use that to upgrade his armor, all of his Doombots, all of his technology. Like the way they explain in the MCU, vibranium has a billion different uses. So of course everybody wants vibranium. Then I believe what we're witnessing in the trailer is Namor and the Atlanteans going after Riri Williams in the Cambridge area. Like, that's why you see Atlanteans in Cambridge here. Because they find out from all the tech that she's the person who built all that, so he blames her. They want to kill her to prevent her from doing that again. And I believe that it's Shuri and Okoye who find out the source of all this and go to protect her from the Atlanteans. And that's why Namor thinks that Wakanda was really behind all this endeavor leading to this escalating to all-out war between Wakanda and Atlantis. When he attacks Wakanda, flooding the throne room here, like this is meant to be Shuri trapped in the throne room here with water surrounding it with the entire building burning down. Later in the trailer, Ramonda seems super pissed off while she's addressing the United Nations, but then also in a meeting with her tribe leaders, she starts shouting about how her entire family is dead, making you wonder what happened to Shuri. Like, why is she saying her entire family is dead? Does that mean that Shuri also died during the movie? 
I think this is Marvel just being a little misleading with the way they cut the trailer. Like, they want you to think that Shuri was killed by Namor too, or at least Ramonda believes that Shuri was killed by Namor, but she's still alive. Then after you see this all-out battle between the forces of Wakanda, like M'Baku trying to attack Namor, like everybody just going crazy, things escalate to this scorched earth policy because Ramonda just goes on the warpath. You see the brand new Black Panther enter frame fighting Namor on the beachhead here near Wakanda as someone has taken the mantle. So a lot of people wondering, like, who is this? Is this Nakia? Is this Shuri? Is this a version of Killmonger coming back? But here's the thing, in order to become the new Black Panther, at least per the rules in the MCU that they've set up, it's a little bit different from the comic book methods. You need a couple things to do that in the MCU, and currently the most important one that's missing, or unavailable, is the heart-shaped herb. Killmonger burnt all of it when he became king and used it to give himself Black Panther powers. The heart-shaped herb also has another important function. It gives the user the ability to transfer their consciousness to the alternate dimension of the ancestral plane. That's how they communicate with their fellow dead ancestors and recently deceased. In the movie, I believe that Shuri is trying to find a technological workaround, a replacement for the heart-shaped herb. Like, they have the molecular structure of the heart-shaped herb stored in their database, and she tries to recreate an artificial version so that they can empower a new Black Panther, because Wakanda must have a Black Panther. Supposedly, she is supposed to try it on herself, hoping to speak with her brother T'Challa on the ancestral plane, get his help in becoming another Black Panther, but instead, something goes wrong because it's not the real heart-shaped herb, and she winds up contacting Killmonger instead in the ancestral plane, and that's how they bring a version of Killmonger back. It's still the same Killmonger, he's still dead, it's just that he's inside the ancestral plane. And Killmonger winds up helping Shuri become the next Black Panther, giving her advice, like a slightly more hardcore version because Killmonger was so militaristic compared to T'Challa. And because Marvel and Kevin Feige have said they're not going to do like a crazy artificial Carrie Fisher type of version of Chadwick Boseman T'Challa. So like they're not going to artificially recreate him in the movie for a scene where he talks to her in the ancestral plane. That's why they're bringing Killmonger back because they're not going to do Force Ghost version of T'Challa. So effectively, Shuri becomes the next Black Panther, and the reason why her new Black Panther suit has all these gold highlights on it that you see in the trailer is way more flashy than T'Challa's Black Panther suit. It's just because it's more to her personal style taste. Like, everything she wears, every time you see her wearing an outfit, it is like the flashiest, most stylistic thing that you've ever seen. And all the gold highlights are also a reference to Killmonger's crazy golden jaguar version of the Black Panther suit. He was all about the showiness of the bright gold highlights over the suit, too. So if he's training her to become the next Black Panther, it also makes sense that some of the gold is inspired by him as well. They also recently just released some Lego sets for the movie, and even though you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt because it's never a one-to-one -one comparison, you see a version of Shuri here with her Panther Hands weapons wearing a new Black Panther suit. For all the people who thought that the new Black Panther would be Nakia, I believe her arc in the movie, she is like a really big character, is that she actually had a relationship with T'Challa, like they kind of set that up in the first Black Panther movie. Even though he got snapped during the five-year time jump, he would have been back in the MCU for at least about three plus years. I believe during the events of the movie, they're going to explain that enough time had passed after Avengers Endgame before his death that she got pregnant with his child at some point, and eventually she'll give birth to his son, and that son will become the next Black Panther when he comes of age. In the comics, most people remember Black Panther had a son named Azari with Storm, but because Chadwick Boseman passed away before Storm was introduced in the MCU, they can't really do a version of that relationship. So I don't know what their long-term plans are for T'Challa's future son. They could always age him up quickly in the next five to eight years and put him on a Young Avengers team like Azari was, or use some time travel trickery to explain how a version from the future who's much older comes back into the past. But there will be a Black Panther 3, like they are going to do a third movie in the trilogy. They'd probably wait to show him on screen or like really talk about him in great detail until we get to that movie. But going forward in the MCU, if Shuri becomes the new Black Panther, I believe they're also planning on splitting the roles in Wakanda too. So normally what happens is you pass the mantle of Black Panther to whoever is going to become the next king of Wakanda. But I believe they're splitting the roles so that Shuri becomes the new Black Panther and henceforth will just cross over with Avengers 5, Kang Dynasty, Avengers 6, Secret Wars, and just have adventures with them traveling all over the world. And M'Baku is going to become the next king of Wakanda after Ramonda. Also, the whole idea of Shuri becoming Black Panther is just them doing the comics too. Like, T'Challa passed the mantle to her. He was still alive at the point, but he went into exile. He passed the mantle to Shuri for a brief period before he came back and took back the mantle. But everyone, post all your theories in the comments. What do you think they're going to do with the next version of the Black Panther? What do you think they're going to do with Doctor Doom in the future of the MCU? And what do you think they're going to do in Black Panther 3? 
The movie's coming out in November, so we're probably going to get another trailer pretty soon, too. There's a big Disney Plus day that's happening in September where Marvel is going to show off a bunch of trailers for all the upcoming Disney Plus series, just like last year. Like, it'll be a trailer fest. Of course, they'll do videos for all the stuff that they drop. We'll also get a bunch of Star Wars Disney Plus trailers, too, so we'll probably get the first Mandalorian Season 3 trailer during that as well. They did show off the trailer video for that a little while ago. You can click here to watch my Mandalorian Season 3 trailer video in Easter Eggs, and click here for my full Black Panther Wakanda Forever trailer video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.